Bob, in trying to understand what memory is, I'm always dumbfounded by the orders of magnitude of difference that scientists talk about, from the subsynaptic level of molecules to massive brain circuits and everything in between. Where is memory in, in biological creatures? And what I'd like you to do is from the neuropsychiatric point of view, having studied in so many disorders, problems of memory, what that can tell us about the nature of memory. Yeah. Well, you know, for me, a starting point is overcoming what seems to be, uh, at least in the past, a widely held assumption that memory was stored someplace in the brain, mm -hmm. in the same way that books are stored in a library. Mm -hmm. And this is something that dies hard. I mean, some of the fundamental experiments in neuropsychology, I was just actually in Montreal and saw Brenda Milner, who had done some of these experiments, where the hippocampi were taken out bilaterally from HM, a very famous patient. These components within the temporal lobe, um, once removed, caused him to have a dense amnesia. He couldn't learn anything new. And this is a cornerstone. And it led people to think that, oh, well, the memories must be stored in the hippocampus because when we took them out, the man lost his, his memory. But I think that this is exactly wrong and is actually misleading. I think what's increasingly recognized is that memory is really a process, not a thing. Um, and that uh, memory is the ability of particular activation states in the brain to be activated again based on the facilitation of synaptic connections. And so I think this fundamental difference in the way of looking at what memory is. Now obviously there are physical changes in the brain that support the likelihood that something is going to be activated again. But when we think about what memory really is as a thing, it really is not a, a concrete entity that is stored anywhere. It is just a likelihood that something is going to happen again in a way that was similar to the way it happened before. So when we remember something, it means that the same or similar enough brain activation state exists and some uh, neuronal circuits in our brain are responsible for detecting whether a neural activation state is new or old. So what can you say about the size of that memory or that neural activation state? Is it uh, a thousand neurons? Is it, uh, is it 10 million neurons? Yeah, closer to a trillion. Uh, <laughs> so most of the things that we talk about as uh, a memory state um, represent the activity across the entire brain. The difference is that there is dedicated circuitry that is responsible for us recognizing whether something is really new or whether something is old. But we, we recognize more than that. Circuitry. We recognize very rich detail about sounds and sights and combinations. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's enormously specific. And each one has to be differentiated, or they all can't be the same. Right. In fact, they're never identical, yeah. um, because they don't exist as specific right. entities. It's right. just a matter of uh, the degree to which that entire neural activation state across hundreds of millions of neurons is overlapping with what went before. And then the degree to which the circuitry that's responsible for monitoring whether things are new or not, whether it's giving us signals, oh yeah, this is a valid memory. I know that this has occurred before. This is a familiar established mm -hmm. uh, circuit activation. But the detail and the nuance, again, has to do just with the, um, the degree to which we have a specificity across hundreds of millions of neurons creating this overall state mm -hmm. in the brain. What can we learn from deficits, from neuropsychiatric disorders in, in which uh, memory plays a part? Yeah, it's really fascinating um, how um, certain syndromes, uh, memory um, disorders, um, have helped us to understand how memory can work in healthy people and how it can go awry. I mean, the classic experiments on HM, the patient who lost his hippocampi, illustrated to us that those um, organs of our brain are critically important for laying down new memories. Um, yet now what we understand from studying the brains of people with advanced Alzheimer's disease is that the cortical representations, um, independent of what happens to the hippocampus, are also critically important in providing the richness and detail of representation that's needed mm. um, by having this widely distributed mm. uh, memory system mm. uh, throughout our brain. Um, and so in dementia, w what happens that causes memory to gradually erode? Yeah. So if we think about what's the cortical contribution to that, because in many dimensions people also have damage to the limbic and hippocampal circuitry, okay. but just the cortical contribution to that seems to be an erosion of the precision and representation of those activation states. Right. So that uh, basically it's as though the, um, the writing 
um, in the tablets uh, begins to be worn away mm. um, because it's not possible to provide the same uh, precision in representation across the entire cortex, mm. even with the same material driving it, mm. the same external stimuli and the same drive um, internally mm. to form our uh, brain networks in a certain way. Mm. How about the difference between working memory, short-term memory, long-term memory? Yeah, so there, there's been quite a bit of work. We know quite a decent amount about how neural activation states are sustained over time in the brain and a lot about the nature of the projections from the frontal lobes to all the posterior cortex that help to sustain those activation states. We also know quite a bit now about the limbic system drivers that tend to disrupt those activation states and enable new activation states to occur. Mm. Um, and that's enabling new memories to be formed. Um, and that's probably very important in understanding how the hippocampus plays its role in the formation of new memories. Mm. Because it's through recognizing that something is new and significant that we then go about the process of built, beefing up the uh, synaptic weights that will support it being reactivated. If there's an emotional uh, uh, weight to the memory, it's more likely to be remembered. Exactly. The more uh, relevant it is and the more new it is, um, the more likely it is uh, to be remembered in right, the future. Right. I mean, I, even in, in my own life, uh, as I've uh, as gotten older, uh, I used to never have to remember where I put my key. But now, if I just make a special effort to, when I put it, to just have a, a, f a focal attention on it, then I, I have no problem. But prior, I didn't have to do that. That's right, and what you're doing in that process is probably bringing in extra cues right. to help to support and elaborate the laying down of that memory. Right. You're building in novelty and significance right. uh, into the encoding right. of that, uh, you know, usually pretty redundant event. Right. Same have... thing happens with people that they park their cars sure. in the same parking lot. Well, which spot did I use? Sure. Um, so those kinds of processes are becoming uh, better understood. So what could we say specifically about the difference between working memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory? Are there different time frames? I, I mean, work Working memory is if somebody tells me a phone number and I have to remember it to dial, and then two seconds later I forgot. So one way to think about it is that the short-term or working memory process is basically the capacity of the brain to sustain an activation state long enough to do something with that information and connect it to an existing behavioral program or action plan. Mm -hmm. It's the subsequent processes of changing our cellular um, architecture, of, of changing the laying down of proteins, increasing the, um, uh, the bridging of synapses that causes a plastic change that takes place over a half hour or a day or two, probably after sleeping. Mm -hmm. And that process lays down the long-term memories and the facilitation of the connections among neurons that support longer-term retrieval. Mm -hmm. So how important is memory in understanding the human mentality? Yeah. Our memory is basically our um, net um, uh, brain um, uh, connection weights, and that is everything about us. Um, you know, our entire history is encoded through the changes in our synaptic activation weights and the ability to connect things together. So I would say that uh, that's the closest we have to defining our soul, mm -hmm. is this, com you know, the composite of all of our um, brain history as it's encoded uh, in the connections between those brain cells.